John, for that very kind introduction, um, which gives me something to live up to, um, and I will now attempt to do that. Uh, first thing I should say is to thank the department uh, for inviting me to give the lecture. Um, thank the Learning Society of Wales for embracing it uh, within its programme, which is uh, a great honour. Um, but let me plunge in. Uh, an alternative title for this talk um, might have been The Science and Planning of Cities and Regions. And I want to start by saying something about uh, the science. And uh, I just want to make a general comment, which is almost cliché um, in, in these first two slides. But what we're always trying to do in science um, is to understand, to use an old physics term, our systems of interest. Um, we're building, we're developing theories, we're building models that are often mathematical to represent <coughs> those theories. And then a lot of the time we're turning them into computer models, uh, which enables us to both run them because they're usually not capable of analytical solutions, and it enables us to get right inside them through the powers of computer visualisation. Because I think I can indicate um, my field of urban and regional modelling is in a sense driven by computer science. So it's entirely appropriate uh, that a talk of this kind uh, should be within the aegis of uh, computer science. However, while this is a familiar picture for physics, chemistry, biology, uh, and those sciences are applied in engineering and medicine in ways that uh, we understand. It's much less developed in the social sciences. Um, and what I want to show is that in my field of studying cities and regions and modeling cities and regions, there is now an embryonic science. And it's an embryonic science which uh, potentially uh, can be applied in planning. Indeed, it's actually been applied uh, in various planning situations. And given the importance of planning in the broad sense to all of us uh, living in cities and regions, um, I would want to argue that it's one of the major scientific challenges uh, of this century. Uh, and my final remark on that slide is to say, unlike elementary particle physics, it's actually not big science, uh, but it actually ought to be. And that would drive the field forward more rapidly. Very interdisciplinary, and uh, so we're bringing together concepts from mathematics, <coughs> computer science, physics, ecology, geography, uh, economics, sociology, planning, and that probably should be uh, a longer list, uh, but that interdisciplinarity uh, is very important. So what I'm going to do is to use what for me has always been, or for long been, a kind of <coughs> archetypal model. Um, where biologists have their nematodes or whatever it is that might enable them to carry their research program forward for a long time. Um, mine now extended, I mean, in fact, uh, much extended, but the favourite model to use to illustrate um, is an urban retail model. Um, and then I'll show you some more contemporary, interesting things with it, uh, like a model of the London riots. And then finally what I'm going to do is to switch into archaeology and history uh, to show how these ideas can be extended beyond uh, contemporary frameworks uh, into very ancient ones. So, what are we modeling? Uh, the left hand side of that diagram is really the population of the city. I'll talk about the city for a short time, although I really mean it could, it could be any region. Uh, so left-hand side, we'd have our demographic models that would embrace migration. Uh, people then offer themselves in part into the workforce um, to be employed, and they will use a very wide range of services. On the right-hand side, you have the urban economy um, connected through trade. Um, it's very interesting, actually, that we're all well aware of trade and balance of payments for countries. Uh, we hear about that month by month uh, and, and so on. But you can actually apply all that to cities. So a very interesting question is what happens if a city has a negative 
balance of payment. Uh, maybe something to come back to later. But it's the economy that's supplying the jobs, it's the economy that's supplying products and services. And these all combine and interact through transport systems, telecommunication systems, uh, all kinds of forms of interaction. And then I say as a geographer, of spatial interaction. So there's a spatial structure on both sides of that, where people live, where the services are, where the jobs are, where people work. And so as you will see in a minute, uh, lots of spatial interaction. What I want to do at the outset is just offer uh, some very important acknowledgements in relation to this talk. Um, a lot of the illustrations and the, indeed the modelling work on retail and on one of my historical examples were done by Joel Dearden uh, when he was at UCL, who's here now, he's in Swansea and in the room, so a lot of the visualisation will be very recognisable to Joel. Uh, Tracy Rill, who's sitting on the front row here, who was in Leeds as a PhD student in, I think it was, I'm not sure I should say that, Tracy, but maybe late 80s, um, who actually led me into archaeology and history. And the examples that I'm going to talk about later, in fact, stem uh, from that time. And then some UCL colleagues, Andy Bevan, Mark Oldswheel, Karen Rudner, Lassio Palmissimo, um, and my own colleagues in CASA, Toby Davis and Hannah Fry. So it's all teamwork, uh, putting these kinds of models together with all the skills that go with it. Let me talk about the retail model uh, for a while. Uh, this is London. Um, the yellow blobs are retail centres in London, and there's something of the order of 200 of them. Um, a failure of graphics, which will be corrected a bit later, because there are light blue dots on a light blue background, so you can't really see the light blue dots. I can see Joel smiling. But um, there are 600 of those. So if you do what? This is purely illustrative. If you do it. Residences by ward, you have around 600. Retail centres, 200. So if you're doing the flows from residential areas to retail centres, you have a 600 by 200 matrix. So even at this very aggregate scale, you start to get a picture of the scale of the problem that we're trying to model. And wonders of mathematics and computing is you can describe that by a single equation. I'm, I'm going to have about four minutes of equations at one point, uh, and, and then there won't be any more after that. But um, this is the basic retail model. Um, so you're labeling residences by zone I, retail centers zone J, flow from I to J, SIJ, expenditure. I'm not going to, the, 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 the variables are all defined there. Um, so Money leaves a residential zone, lands in a retail zone. Um, you have various parameters, travel costs represent the networks, and so on. So, um, basic equation, um, the expenditure that's available is shared out by that factor on the right-hand side. But uh, all I want you to believe is that if I'm doing this in aggregate for London, calculating 12,000 flows, one formula, uh, and the computer will just churn around it and, and calculate 12,000 flows. And of course the interesting thing then is it's not constrained at the retail end, so you can actually use this kind of model to <coughs> estimate the flow of money into retail centres. Uh, I'm going to show you in a minute how you can derive this by entropy maximising methods. Um, and this was my early academic work, which I have to say now goes back to the 1960s, it's 40 odd years old, um, but it's an interesting story. Um, but these kinds of interactions were modelled by analogy with Newtonian gravity. Um, and as I'll show you in a second, uh, it turned out to be the wrong analogy, and you had to switch to Boltzmann and statistical mechanics. And I'll show you in a second how that. Uh, came about. So, uh, this is the three or four minutes of mathematics and how to do entropy maximizing. So, I've changed notation very slightly. My flows are called TIJ instead of CIJ. Um, and I've got origin 
zone, OI, destination zone, DJ, um, a cost of travel, CIJ, and I'm going to develop that TIJ matrix. So, in the early days, back in the 1950s, and it's very interesting that the urban modeling basically has parallel computers. It has a longer history, but it was really only in the early days of computers in the late 50s that this kind of computation began. And this is the Newtonian model. And so basically, OIDJ is the product of two masses divided by the distance squared, except there I've got it divided by CIJ to the beta, but essentially it's Newtonian. Um, and it doesn't satisfy what you actually know which if I'm doing retail is the amount of cash that leaves a zone or the doing journey to work is the number of workers who leave a zone. So those two equations, and it doesn't add up the other way. So it doesn't satisfy those two equations. So how can you have a model that doesn't satisfy equations that you actually know? So this is 1950s, and it was in the hands of American engineers who were building big highways. And so being good engineers, they put some fudge factors in the front. And so they put these AIBJ factors in the front. Uh, they worked them out, um, and uh, that was it. And they ran the models, and they all worked. Uh, and nobody really thought very much about it. I was given the job when I first came into this field of um, building these kind of models in Britain. And they didn't exist in Britain at the time. And so I looked at these equations. and. Um, I'd, I'd done a very interesting and quite thorough course in statistical mechanics when I was a student. And this is an interesting bit about serendipity, really. So I looked at these equations, and they're not exactly partition functions that turn up in statistical mechanics, but they're not far off. And so I thought, you know, let's change the analogy. So you then ask a different kind of question, which is the statistical mechanics question, which is, what is the mo what, what's the most probable system that's compatible with those constraints? And then you optimize this thing here, and I'll say what it is in a minute, this equation 7. And of course, if you think of these numbers, these are factorials, so there are enormous numbers in there. And of course, Boltzmann's great discovery in statistical mechanics um, was that if you ask the right question, you actually got a very secure... Uh, answer. <coughs> and so if you think of the TIJ matrix, big matrix, um, I mean that's obviously idealised, you know, it could be thousands of rows and columns, um, and then put it in a table, and at the top you want the most probable distribution that will satisfy the constraints. And there are lots of ways of doing this, and that's the middle row. What Boltzmann did in statistical mechanics was work out how to count the number of ways of having microstates that would give rise to one of these. And it's one of those that becomes actually the most probable. So you do the arithmetic again. You add what physicists would call an energy constraint, and you've got your others. You maximize not that W, which is horrible, you maximize the log of that, and then the log of a factorial you can use still its approximation or the rest of it. So it all becomes solvable. And out come these equations. And so the beauty of this is the AIs and BJs cease to be fudge factors, and they become something that actually arises out of looking at that theory in a different way. And um, there's one very interesting thing about it though, that when you do the arithmetic, when you do the calculus, I should say, instead of having the Cij to the minus beta, you're having a negative power function, you have an exponential function. So you suddenly get new insights, which is that if you believe this way of doing it, or uh, and this works for your data, it means that people are perceiving travel costs linearly, but you can recover Cij to the minus beta if you want it by replacing CIJ by log CIJ. What that's saying is if that fits better, people are perceiving travel costs logarithmically. So what you can then infer from that, which turns out to be true, is if you've got a system with a lot of short trips, this will work. If you 
you've got a system with a lot of very long trips, people start behaving as though they're on a long scale, and another one will fit. So, what we've done... Yeah, is we're, this modification for you. Sorry, you? This modification. Yeah. So what we've done is we've maximized log W, and of course S equals K log W is the formula which is engraved on Boltzmann's grave in Vienna. Um, and so that, that is the entropy. And of course it's equivalent to Shannon's entropy. And that always gives me an interesting tale to tell if you haven't heard it. But uh, when Shannon developed information theory in the 1940s, um, he produced a version of this kind of entropy as a measure of information. And he went to von Neumann, a very famous mathematician, and said, so it has this function, and it works for information theory, but what shall I call it? And von Neumann said that he will call it entropy, because it's equivalent to the formula that physicists use in physics, it's entropy. And by the way, if you call it entropy, no one will understand it, and so if you ever have an argument, you will win. <laughs> so... Um, but now you all understand entropy, so that's the end of uh, the technical bit. So we can convert, we can do exactly the same to the retail model. Any, the, the, the point about this as a method is that anything which involves a large population, um, so molecules of air in this room, large population, you do statistical mechanics. Uh, a large population traveling around the city, you can do that. You can use the same average procedure and get these results. Now, I want to go back to retail uh, for a minute. And if you've got the original retail model, I had a W factor in, which is actually a measure of attractiveness. And I said it was an aggregate model. When you try to do that for real, so in a sense, when you're trying to do the science of this for real you've got to add much more detail. And I won't go through this uh, in, in, in that detail, but you've got to distinguish uh, different kinds of people, different kinds of goods, different kinds of stores, um, and you can build all that, you can build all that in. And then at the time that we were doing this, and doing it properly, uh, in Leeds, uh, we actually set up a university spin-out company called GMAP. And, um, I've put this slide on, it's an old GMAP slide, and it shows GMAP's clients and enables me to make two interesting points in terms of the use of this kind of model. Uh, the first is uh, that they are incredibly well tested. Um, these kind of companies we pay in GMAP, they're lots of money to run these kind of models to plan their networks and their location policies. So very well tested. Uh, but the next point that I want to make, and I'll elaborate a little bit of this for, a, a little further on, um, is that they're nearly all private sector. Um, and, and, and so just, as it were, hang on to that. And the point about <coughs> the private sector latching up to this, Ford Motor Company, uh, 8,000 car and dealerships in the UK, 2,000 by Ford, we can tweak that 2,000 and improve their bottom line by a small percentage by using these methods, that is worth a small fortune. And so it's on that basis that we're paying us a lot of money to do it. So the big question is, why aren't we doing this in health, the hospital planning, polyclinics, GPs? Uh, why aren't we doing it in education, or we reform the school system uh, at regular intervals without doing any of this kind of analysis? do it for universities, uh, we could do it for the criminal justice system, and so on. So, um, but, but very little of that is done. Um, it's done in retail, uh, it's, sorry, it's done in retail, but it's done in transport. Um, and I'll give you one transport example, but within the context of a general model. So I'm going to look at group of people who work for David Simmons, David Simmons consultants, um, who've taken this kind of structure uh, but turned it into a proper model. So you've got the economic model, you've got the urban model, uh, the, the attraction model, you've got the population model, you've done a different way around to me. You can estimate the transport consequences of this. Um, 
doing it in Scotland, different sizes of zone systems. Um, I put this slide on just to indicate the categorization that has to go into doing this properly. So you've got to have quite fine categories. Um, and then, of course, you finish it with some quite large um, arrays. And what they were doing in this case was doing a test of the reopening of a railway line. And uh, so this particular Bathgate to Airdrie uh, line reopens. And because they've got the transport model combined in the comprehensive model, they can actually estimate the impact of change, population change on the right, change in employment on the left. And you can start to do a different kind of cost-benefit analysis uh, on the results. Now, this is my last equation, I think. Um, and this is the shift. What I've been doing so far is short-run equilibrium modelling. Um, what I want to do now is to switch to doing dynamic modelling, which is a much bigger scientific challenge. Um, and it turns out, again, the, 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 this is a very, very simple-looking equation. So... The J's are going to be retail sectors. Um, this is going to be the revenue. This is going to be the cost of running the retail centre, whether you're a developer or whatever. And all that equation is saying is that if the retail centre in a particular place is profitable, that is DJ's growth in KWJ, it will grow. If it's not profitable, it will decline. And I've called that a lock of Volterra equation because that's like the retail centres being species competing for resources, but what they're actually doing is competing for consumers to take their money from them. You, you cannot call it like because it should be non-linear. It is going to be very non-linear. It's going to be very non-linear because the original model has to produce the DJ, and this produces very, very substantial non-linearities. And in fact, this gets to the interesting bit. So, um, we can run these kinds of models, and, um, and this is one of Joel's um, visualizations, uh, which is the evolution of a system in London where something very dramatic happens, and you finish up with a much smaller number of large centers. But the, and then you can look at all the flows. I, I, I won't try and explain the uh, artistic effects uh, but come into the rest of it. But it's that structure, it's the jump from one kind of structure to another, which you start to be able to model. And in fact, if we do this on a grid, each little square on this grid is the whole system. And what you start to see, uh, the... the, the Axes are the two parameters in the model, the main parameters. And for different parameter values, you get different spatial structures. But the interesting thing is you get phase changes. You get sudden jumps from one kind of system to another. So um, where the hand is there, you see the beginnings of a jump from a system with lots of centers to a system with a very small number of centers. Um, and so we get into a very interesting bit of nonlinear dynamics because it's one of the properties. So what we've done now is we've combined Boltzmann and Locker and Volterra, which is, is quite an interesting thing to do. So I sometimes call these uh, BLV uh, models. And in fact, I've made the point at the end, when I first got into this, uh, there was a town planning journal which... Uh, on entropy maximizing stuff, wrote a leading article that said, people are not particles. Shouldn't do this. Um, you know, this is outrageous, etc., etc. Um, but they missed the point, because they thought I was, in a way I was working by analogy from physics. But what you've got with something like entropy is you've got a higher level concept that then applies in a whole variety of disciplines. Um, so you're not relying on the physics although the physicists got there first, and so it makes it more interesting to uh, look at it in those terms. So this is then back to your point, very non-linear. Because they're non-linear, multiple equilibrium solutions, path dependence, which means very dependent on the initial conditions. So in urban development terms, it means dependent on, as it were, where you are. Um, phase changes we've just seen. 
emergent behaviour, new kinds of structures. And this, of course, is the language of what is very fashionable now, which is complex in science. So um, I now realise I've been practising complexity science for uh, many years. I've now rebadged myself for research council purposes as a complexity scientist, um, which attracts funding more easily. Um, but it's interesting to see the power of these things. Um, and these kind of models, I'm just saying there, can be applied uh, in a whole variety of circumstances. <coughs> what, is that? What, what this allows is for you to get right inside. This is for a single retail zone. And the straight line is what it costs. So as the size gets bigger, you're on a straight line. It turns out when you do the analysis on the DJ, you get a logistic curve. And the top intersection is, um, is a stable point, as is zero. So it can either be zero or, um, or, or final. However, suppose you're in a situation where one of these things moves. Imagine that line moving so that you don't have an intersection. And that's the mechanism that determines whether you have a system with a small number of large centers or a large number of small centers. And you can actually do this analysis zone by zone, and you can get actually right inside it. Um, so that then leads to a new idea. We're talking about path dependence. We're talking about dependence on initial conditions. Um, and again, just to put a, a sort of you know, to try, try to attract people to this sort of science. You can think of that as being the DNA of the urban system, you know, because the initial conditions determine uh, where you can get to. And I've spelled it out there in terms of uh, some of the variables. So, get a sign that Joel found. Think of doing forecasting of hurricanes from a point where you know where it is, uncertainty builds and you get this two-dimensional map. If we try and do this for cities, because what I'm, going to, what I'm going to say now is something interesting about the forecasting. What I was doing with retail systems, it's great for short-run forecasting. What, when you start doing the dynamics, it shows that it's actually very much more difficult to get beyond the medium term and the long term, because the uncertainties increase fairly dramatically. Um, this is a representation of what we would try to do to move a system forward. But, what you've got to remember, if I go back to London again, I had 200 retail centres. So, the cone of possible development from London's existing DNA to be built by methods I won't go into uh, is a 200 dimensional cone. So, I think there are some big challenges for mathematicians as well as computer scientists for handling these kinds of manifolds. So, I've just described uh, some of the challenges, but they're fairly obvious. Right, for my last um, 10 or 15 minutes, I'm going to say that gives you some idea about the science and, in principle, how it can be used. Um, and I'm now going to show you uh, a range of examples. So I'm going to start with the London riots, um, and then I'm going to turn into um, archaeology and history. Um, so, London riots, um, everybody will be familiar with this kind of photograph from, uh, it wasn't just 18 months ago, something of that order. And, um, my co-authors are on the bottom there. If you want to read this in detail, it's actually just been published in uh, Scientific Reports, uh, which is, of course, an open access internet journal. So um, you can actually, if you search on London Riots, you'll get straight to this paper. It was published last week. Um, so everybody knows what happened. There were five days of rioting, lots of crime, uh, lots of damage. Um, so why try and model it? Um, did the police get it right? Um, what happened over five days was there were three and a half thousand police on the streets at the start, and there were 16,000 other police by day five. Um, what's the theory? I'm trying to build models to represent theories. Was it connected to deprivation? Uh, was there some kind of social network viral? 
nature of the way it started. Um, it was described as free shopping at the time, uh, inquisitive behaviour. Uh, can we generate the patent? And as it happened, we got some very good data. We got, uh, it turns out that the addresses of people arrested for alleged rioting are, are, are public, basically. And they were supplied to us by the Metropolitan Police. Um, so we can actually look at journey to riots. I've been doing journey to shop uh, and so on. This is the propensity to riot uh, and, and, and how far you travel. And we can look at the data. Data tells us you can travel very far. Uh, link with deprivation, very interesting. The, the left hand plus, I'll just concentrate on that. Um, the vertical axis is the average number of riots as suspects per thousand population in a small area. Uh, and the horizontal axis, uh, axis is uh, the index of multiple deprivation. And it's almost a straight line. We were very surprised it was uh, you know, quite as linear as that. Um, so that confirmed what we were trying to do. So to build a model, we have to say decision to participate, choice of where to go, and how that interacts with the police. And in that case, in the middle, we've got a retail model. Uh, so the way to go, we use the retail model that we use as an example. Um, the decision to participate, we've used models from epidemiology, so we've treated it as a kind of infection um, that would allow for the viral nature of it, viral in a social network sense. And then on the police end of it, um, We've got a model which we took from some American literature on the probability of you being arrested. Uh, and it turned out when we did the detail of it, that whether you will have heard this, we, so it's a quite interesting thing is that the police won't arrest anybody at the site unless they outnumber the number of rioters there, which explains quite a lot of what was seen by many of us as standing around um, when uh, we looked at various television pictures. But anyway, we can work out the probability of rest. And then, I'm not showing you the model in this case, but the model produces simulated results that are basically quite uh, plausible. Um, but probably the most interesting uh, plot is this one. We, on the vertical axis, we, we put in a measure of uh, severity of rioting. And on the horizontal axis, we had the number of police on the streets. And so we actually ran the model for different numbers of police. Um, uh, on the streets. And what it shows is that if there was something like five or six thousand police on the streets at the start, it would stop pretty quickly. And it also shows you don't need 16,000. But of course, nobody knew that at the time. Um, so I'm not being critical in that sense. Um, but what I think it shows is that if we get this sort of science right, um, we've basically given a tool to the police for managing uh, these kinds of situations. Right, switch again. Um, so I'm going to go into, um, into archaeology now. And in archaeology, we have um, potentially two kinds of data, although I'm only really going to talk about point data. Um, so often there's some notion of where settlements existed. And sometimes you can infer something about migration from artifacts and so on, but leave, leave that on one side because we haven't really managed to do that yet. So the thing about the point data is, in many cases, and I'll show you some quite dramatic versions of this in a second, um, you've got a pretty good idea from aerial photography where the sites were, because there are changes in level and so on, um, but you don't have a lot of information on the sites. So the challenge is to use the dynamic retail model, reinterpret the flows to be migration and trade flows, and then run into equilibrium and see what the settlement structure looks like. I think the next slide will be very familiar to Tracy because she produced it, um, which is where she started when she and I began to do this work together in Leeds. Um, this is 9th century BC, 8th century BC, 7th century BC, Greece. Um, and these were the known sites. 
So we run the model, do an analysis, uh, and see what, the, what, what, what emerges. And out comes Athens, Thebes, Corinth. And we were really very pleased at that point. Um, but um, in a situation where we knew quite a lot about science, um, we would seem to be getting the right results. Um, maybe a question for later. The, the Hiri, if that's how you pronounce it, top right, uh, was not thought to be a big site. It hadn't really been investigated. I think if we'd had the courage of our convictions, we'd have said, go there with your spades because we think it's a big site. But this is what we're actually now about to do in Iraq. So I will explain how this comes about. Um, quick flick through these slides. This is the switch from 1980s computer graphics to 2012 computer graphics. So this is Andy Bevan in UCL Archaeology, who's also put in some topography into this, um, and reworked these results. Uh, Tracer sent us a wonderful old-fashioned computer printout where we were trying to recover the promises that we'd used originally. But anyway, the, the, these are the, the, but basically a reproduction. <coughs> um, before I get on to Iraq, um, Andy Bevan, I've been working with in UCL Archaeology, uh, has been working on Crete. Um, and you can do the same kind of thing. Um, there are areas where there are no palaces, so we assume that those are big settlements. Um, and what's interesting uh, about this, and uh, Andy was very clever here, was uh, throwing in points, I'm going to say random points, but they're not random as to where settlements might be that are consistent with the spatial statistics of the settlements that we do know about. And what we do in that case is we run the model over and over and over again uh, and see whether it produces consistent results. And so you get these heat map type things uh, which produce the results and then we can do uh, the same kind of plotting. So that's just another uh, example. But let me do um, let, let, let me do Iraq, um, and uh, it turns on a rather um, ironic um, situation in which my colleagues in UCL archaeology um, find themselves. But um, for many many years, um, their main site, uh, one of their main sites, was in the Kurdistan region in Iraq. Um, it then turned out in Saddam Hussein's reign that it was becoming far too difficult. Uh, so they moved to Syria. <coughs> so they've now moved back to Iraq. <coughs> so what it actually means is uh, they have a site in Iraq where they have a pretty good idea of where the settlements are, no idea whatsoever about size. And in this case, they really want to go and start digging uh, where we predict the biggest settlement to be. Um, so, you know, what I might have hoped to do with Tracy, as you might have hoped to do in Greece, but uh, we now will do in Iraq. So, switch to Syria, the Jazeera region of Syria, where the last 10, 20 years work has been done. Uh, and not, a, not, not a, a, a reasonable idea of the structures, the history, the size of the settlements from all this work. And so what we're doing is we're calibrating the models on Jazeera and then we'll transfer the, with you know, a bit of hope and wishful thinking maybe, uh, the parameters into Iraq. Uh, so this is the kind of analysis we get um, for Jazeera. Um, and then we go back to this. And we've started running it in Iraq. And, uh, in effect, we're teasing out from the topology of these structures um, where the big site might be. So in that case, the digging might actually start. The fourth and final example is, is back to more recent uh, history. And this is work um, I did with Joel when Joel was in Leeds. Um, was to a totally different system. We're going to look at the evolution of the American urban system uh, over this period. It took 1790 to 1870 uh, because it's interesting in terms of the impact of railways in the 1840s, 1850s, um, and also there was quite good census data. 
um, for American cities uh, through this period. Um, so that was our study area. Um, for various reasons, we were quite interested in Chicago, which is why Chicago's been put <coughs> out there. Um, mainly because a lot of our data came from a wonderful book by a man called Cronin called Nature's Metropolis, which is about how uh, Chicago evolved. So it's a good bit of dynamics. Um, and again, it's making the point that if we can understand contemporary urban dynamics, we can start to do history with the same kind of dynamic uh, models. So that's our study area. Uh, put a grid over it to get a zone system, so 434 zones. Um, we use the idea of a spider network to represent the transport system, so we connected uh, nearby links um, instead of having the real transport system, but it's one that looks uh, reasonably plausible. Um, so this shows what the whole system looks like. The green links are roads, the blue links are water. So there was a waterways route around the Great Lakes from Chicago to the East Coast and so on. Uh, and there were obviously some river routes. And the black lines are um, railway lines. We calibrated it, results grid again. And then in 1790, uh, the bulk of the American urban system was actually on the East Coast for obvious reasons. Migrants coming across the Atlantic, uh, transport system awful. Um, so we've used a version of the dynamic retail model, again, as in the archaeology case, uh, assuming that the flows are now migrants, trade, um, and you know, we've got to assume some kind of composite index. Um, and then we can see how this then actually develops. So it does a year in half a second, and then it slows down when the railways are built, and it does a second a year. So nothing much will happen for a while, except the cities on the east coast for uh, Then when it gets into the 1840s, we start to see the odd railway and then in the 1850s, it actually went mad in terms of railway building, if you know your American history. So it slows down now, and then in the 1850s, it just bang, in come the railway lines, um, and the Midwest develops. There are other reasons why Chicago became dominant uh, than just the railways, but the railways were a very important part of it. And uh, we compared those results with, um, with the American census data through those periods. And for a very rough model, uh, you know, they actually weren't bad. Um, we, you know, they were, they, these are our notional flows. So in 1790, they were both small and they didn't go very far. Um, if you do the 1870 version, they're much higher and they go a long way because the railway lines are carrying uh, these flows. So, you can see the impact of the railways with uh, this, this, this kind of model. So, I'm just using that one example to say that I think there are actually huge opportunities um, in fields like history and archaeology to deploy uh, these models. A um, lot more we can do with it. Um, and Clearly, we're, we're, we're operating at a very rudimentary level. So I just want to wind up with uh, a few uh, concluding comments. Um, first is just to say, you know, the history <laughs> of this kind of modelling is about 200 years old, uh, but it's really, as I said earlier, only since the advent of the computer um, that the field has really developed. And it's only in very recent years um, that... Um, we've really been able to do the dynamic model uh, that I've been showing you. Of course, now I think we can look forward to <coughs> another leap in computing power, uh, which will also help us. So, lessons to come from this. There's a tremendous amount we can do now. So, retail, transport, planning, town planning. We can do a lot more in public services, 
um, and, and for various reasons we're not really doing that. We can take these models into new fields like archaeology and history. And there's a very interesting research front line on modeling the evolution of cities and regions uh, in terms of the idea of a city DNA, cones of possible development. And you can actually, in the way that from you know, the, the DNA of molecular biology you can get into genetic medicine, you can actually start to think of the idea of genetic planning. Um, because if what you want to achieve isn't within the cone of possible development, then you have to tweak something quite seriously to redirect your system. So we're on the edge of being able to do uh, things of that kind. Um, so final slide, it, it's a dedicated but relatively small army uh, that's working on this kind of science. And I think it's an even smaller army that's applying this science in major areas of planning. So what I hope I've convinced you of is, uh, A, it's interesting now, but the future potential is huge uh, for both science and policy development and planning supported by this kind of science. And hence my argument that the army should be a lot bigger and uh, we should persuade uh, governments to treat this as big science.